read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back hey welcome back lady listeners to the second installment of palpitation i realized as soon as we got finished with on tuesday's episode i forgot to read the book bio so i'm going to read that for you right now so you've got it to hear and if for some chance you missed the first installment you can listen to this and then go back <laughs> <laughs> the kiss i stole from leonardo moreno on my 18th birthday must have been the worst kiss of his life because within months he enlisted in the army and i never saw him again Talk about ghosting. I did everything I could to forget the tall, dark, and handsome soldier with soulful brown eyes. Instead, I focused on getting my medical degree and starting my emergency medicine residency. When a family emergency leads me back home, the last person I think I'll see is a civilian. as a civilian is Leo. Sparks fly when we reconnect, and this time, instead of pushing me away, he holds on tight. Now all we have to do is keep up a secret from his best friend, my overprotective older brother. I love it. Oh my God, that brother is so hot. I know. (laughs) So I just wanted to mention that real quick. And we'll talk about Ophelia and all her great stuff in just a little bit. But um, I saw a video the other day and it really, it took me way back. It was Alessandra Torre. And um, she was posting something on Instagram. It was like a reel. And mm-hmm. she was saying she had a copy of her book and it's called Undertow, but it didn't used to be called that. It used to be called Sex, Love, Repeat. I remember and that. Yes. It was one of my most favorite books. I think it was my favorite book I read that year when I read it. It was at least in the top five. But um, I think it was 2013 she said she published it. Mm-hmm. And she said this and it, it would just rang true. She said, if you were not reading Indie romance in 2013, she was like, it hit different. She said, you know, romance today is great and everything about it's awesome. She was like, but you need to go back and read yeah. 2012, 13, 14 romances. Yeah. She I was agree. like, she was like, there was some fucked up shit getting written. And she said, this book right here, she was like, I would never write anything like this today. And she even said, she was like, I don't know how I wrote this. And then went and sat down at the breakfast table with my family. <laughs> I don't know how I did it. I'm t- and I'm telling you, that book is so good because it's got a lot of good twists to it. Like, it's a big, big twist that I just loved. It was a great concept. But it was also really fucking dirty. And she's yeah. right. Like, something about that back then, it was like. It was, it was almost like we just didn't give a shit. We didn't like, give a shit. I no. makes me wonder because we started writing that one book and I think it was supposed to be filthier than it would, ended up being. Mm-hmm. Which one? It's like, um, tra- I don't know if we're going to name it that still. Trashy? Uh-huh. Yeah. I thought it was going to be, I was like, this is going to be so filthy. And it would turn out, it was a little dirty, but then it was sweet. I was like, yeah. mm-hmm. I think I was thinking like trailer park virgin at first. Well, trailer park virgin sweet. Like that's what's funny is. about it is it's like, it's very sweet, it's but it's so also fucked really, up. it's really fucked up too. I know. But then again, like there's no way we would write about a stepdad and a stepbrother and the girl in a three way. I just don't see us writing that kind of book anymore, you know, or at least we haven't written that, that kind of book since then. We've never written anything like that, but it, it should, she's right though. Like in a way there were a lot of romances back then that you just, oh my God, there were, I just scrolled through my Kindle when she said that I was like, you know what? I know. I've done that before when I was, remember that one time I couldn't find that book and somebody found it for me. I had (laughs) scrolled back so far. Mm -hmm. I was seeing all these old books. I was like, oh my God, Mm -hmm. it's crazy. And some of these authors have just disappeared too. Yeah. That's really, yeah. That's something about it too. It's sad, but you know, it's a tough industry to have a long career in, you know, I'd say if you can make it, more than five years as a writer, you're doing it. Like yeah. you're fucking in it just because like there, you know, there's some authors who wrote like two or three books and then that was all they, that's all they could do, you know? And it's it may, not, I can't remember the name of that one book. She was like that. Remember she wrote where he like kidnapped her 
and he was like preparing her to sell mm-hmm. her. Yeah, captive she, in the dark. Cap that captive in the dark. That book mm-hmm. was fucked up. That fucked Super my fucked mind up. up. I've had yeah. a book like I've PTSD from that book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because the book is about this girl gets kidnapped and her captor is preparing her for like the person she's being sold to. She's essentially like 18 or something, if that, when she gets kidnapped. He's horrible. And he's hor- so fucking mean to her. And all it's this crazy. other stuff is happening around them. Oh Even some of the God. stuff that happens around them, I'm like, oh, it's like I remember that. Uh-huh. Like, it's PTSD so fucked up. That. But I think yet. after that, I started. That's when I started researching books before I read them. I'm like, I have to research. <laughs> but the thing is, is like that book is still so fucking good. It's so twisted. It's but so it's twisted, like, and you still get turned on in oh heart. Oh my god! And you're still, you're like, and there's a happily ever after. <laughs> like yeah. you know, that's what C.J. Roberts. If you want to go look it up, it's they said duet. It's called the Dark Duet. She only wrote a few books, and I, I the few books she wrote, they're. Bam, in my brain from eight, nine years ago. I was going to say, I think she only has maybe those two or three books. And I think that's it. But, you know, and that's the thing is like, it's not that she wasn't an incredible writer. It's just, you know, okay. So this is what, all right. So this, this reminds me of when I went talking about the Alessandro Torre, the thing that led me to this was they, somebody said, what do you wish that you knew? He said, authors, if you've published 10 books or more, what's something you wish you knew now that you didn't know then? And Kylie Scott got on there and she said, she said something to the effect of, you know, get your newsletter started, get your website, get your domain and everything right away. Get your social media handles, everything set up first. And then she said, you know, figure out your name, do that right away. Like do all of those things first. She's like, because That's how I always know if somebody's a pen name. What do you mean? If I, if a brand new book comes out from an author I've never heard of and I click them and they have like two books and they've got a website, all their social media <laughs> yeah. is all, I'm like, they're this doing bitch it the right is way. a pen name. Yeah. <laughs> so they have it together. They know what they're doing. But Kylie even said, but I just thought that's great advice in general, you know, mm-hmm. and I actually had a friend, you know, when Abby Knox got started out, you know, this was a pen name for her, but it's her only author name. But it was one of those things that I told her, I was like, hey, you need to have all this set up before you launch. So it's it's not always necessarily a pen name or maybe it's just somebody who's got a friend that's an author and has helped them through this. Yeah, but, that's true. But Kylie did mention, she said, I just started writing and started publishing and I didn't have any of that set up. And she said, somebody saw me doing well and they took my name and took the domain and for like the, for her website. And I was wow. like, fuck, I did not know any of that. And so she was like, yeah. So, so anyway, she said that was something she wished she had known, you know, starting out was that you've got to hard, you've got to really work on your newsletter because she said because social media is fickle and she said so are you know you never know what how you're going to reach your audience and she said you have to be able to reach your readers off of social media yeah. because she said those platforms can be taken away and that is so fucking true yeah. so she said your newsletter is your most valuable thing and i was just like yeah that's abs-. and alessandra torre was echoing that in her video when she was talking about romance in 2013 but you know and then kylie said at the end of it she was like you know she was like try not to be an asshole try to be a good person because she said you know this industry is up and down and she said and romance has a long memory so she said, you know, try not to do that. And she said, oh, and get some thick skin because you're going to need it. <laughs> and I was just like, oh. But, you know, a lot of that is so true about some of the authors. Like even, you know, there was a problem. I don't think she was really problematic. I don't, I didn't consider her problematic. I read her books and um, she did MC books and she was like, kind I already of know dark. what you're going to say. Yeah. So she, you know, she did MC books and stuff and she was a little on edge. But she kind of got ran out of the romance industry because of, you know, she just, I don't know. Like, it seemed like. Oh, yeah, she doesn't write it anymore, I don't think. I don't know. No, she wrote that one series. And then I saw later, she's friends with another author. And I saw later that, like, she went to a book signing or something. But she has, like, it, you know, you talk about PTSD. It's like the same thing. It's like she can't even you know, be around it because, you know, she like, I guess she had such a hard time with fans and people, how they treated her and stuff and the, and the books she wrote. But I mean, you know, the books she wrote were, 
they were MC books, but they were really fucked up and not like, I don't even know if I'm saying this the right way. Like, I don't know. There can be considered some forced submission. Yeah. Some yeah. Violent. There was a lot I don't that. know. There was a, a lot, lot of violence and stuff. But like, I mean, it wasn't anything. It wasn't like something was racist or, you know, anything. Like, it wasn't that kind of thing. It was like the subject matter she wrote was really fucked up. And people gave her so much shit about it. And I didn't necessarily hate the books. You know, <laughs> like I read them. Some of them I liked. But, you know, she doesn't write anymore. And it's one of the, you know, kind of like Holly said, like, oh, you're going to need some thick skin. And it's like, yeah, it, it is because you just never know. God, it is it is so different when you think people will talk shit about you and then actually seeing it in front of your face. It is very oh, different. People will say whatever they want over the fucking Internet. They oh, got my some God. Big ass balls. And yeah, because they think they can say anything to you. Yeah. Like I have been called the absolute worst things ever on the Internet. Like someone just said it to me. Like they had a right to call me this. <laughs> like it was totally fine to call me up because they have some belief that they they think they get the to pass judgment on me, you know. So it's like, yeah, you know, you've got to get a thick skin. But there's no preparing for something like that, and it really fucks with some people. And there were a lot of authors who like is the second they got something bad said about them, that was it. They couldn't do it anymore. And I don't fault them for it, but I think that goes a long way to explain at least one or I think around. some of the problem with that is when. They get the initial slap of that. Mm -hmm. That's maybe a warning I would give a new author is mm -hmm. don't respond to that smack. Yeah. Do not give that smack any fucking attention. Because it if you start to fight, yeah. then it starts to roll. And yeah. it gets bigger and it gets bigger and it gets mm -hmm. bigger. And it, there's no solving it. There's two sides. It's going back and forth. Some people think this side's right. Some people think this side's are Just... Mm -hmm. Don't even engage it. Yeah. You know, I think that's something I'll, I look back on with our books being taken down, you know, and it was like people just saying things and stuff and we just did not engage. It, you just can't. Yeah. You're, you're not going to convince people of something that they think they believe. It's no. The same, it's like politics and stuff. I'm like, yeah. I'm not going to, you don't know me from a hole in the wall. I'm not mm -hmm. going to be able you have some preconceived notion. Yeah. That. I mean, like we could have literally posted bank statements online you know what i mean we could have posted our passwords to everything we own and people would have still called you know if they if they think you're a liar they think you're a liar you know like there's people don't want evidence that when they're angry and they have a place to put their angry their anger yeah you know people don't want to hear it and it, yeah. that's really hard in this industry when like when something like that happens, because it inevitably will happen if you're in it long enough, something yeah. will inevitably happen. And it, you know, you own up to what you do and then just try to move on. You know, it's, it's so crazy. The, the authors that were around back then that are still around and still going at it, you know, it's interesting to see their careers and how they've turned out and what they're still doing and, you know, that sort of thing and, and how they're still selling books. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's few and far between that can make it that long in writing and be successful. at. Because even some of the big ones have fought like, where the fuck did Maya Banks go? I don't know. She got really sick, remember? And then it was like, we just never heard from her again. Like, I haven't seen any new books. I'm like, where is um, the other one that did all the books? Her name was Cynthia, I think. Sylvia no. Day? No. No. God, what was the one? She had the books where it was like, one was like, oh my God, it's going to drive me insane. You read them all. Wait, Cynthia Eden? No. Her name, she did the paranormal, and like one was a ghost, and then she had the know. mafia series where one was a protector. What, what was her fucking name? I don't know. I can't think of it. Oh my god, I don't know who you're talking name. about. Insane. Oh man, you know, it's it's tough. To I have. bet if I look up JR Ward, it'll pop up with it on Amazon. Hey, wait, she always Wait, she came with J.R. Ward? I'm just saying, you know how sometimes it recommends on Amazon? It's like, if you like J.R. Ward, you might like this Did person. this author write vampires? 
She did at one point. Oh my god! But you, you read her other Cynthia? ones. You read her mafia ones. I don't know. If she god, now I want to know. <laughs> and she's not on here. Oh my god! Eagles read them all. Um, oh. Wait, Cressley Cole? Yes, she's back to publishing. Is she? Yep, she's got a new book out. Well, it came out like maybe a month ago. Moreno, okay. Moreno. She was gone for like three years. Oh no, it was like eight years. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was a long time. She was gone. And she had some good books. And then yeah, she was, like, she was fantastic. Like, yeah. Oh my God, The Professional. Oh my, if you haven't read The Professional by Cresley Cole, immediately stop this podcast and go listen to it. It's so good. But um. I no. wonder if they're building anxiety or something. Yeah, and know, that's what I've she had, said. She I've said had, it was like pressure. I have that right now. After I had that panic attack and I got on my medication or whatever, mm -hmm. I still have each day to get myself to start writing, I have panic. Mm -hmm. Like before I like write, to get myself to set down and start mm -hmm. is the hardest part of my day. Like, a panic starts to rise like what if I sit down and nothing comes out mm -hmm. every day it does that so I wonder if that it's something like that that grows where I'm trying to work on mine and I'm worried about that yeah. therapist yeah. and taking medication so I can get through it mm -hmm. but letting something like that get out of control well you know that's really similar to what Frankie Love had talked about where she was just getting burnout from having these quick releases all the time and this demand, you know, especially being in Kindle Unlimited where you're paid per page count to be constantly feeding the machine. And burnout is so real, but you can't even allow yourself that break because you have to keep feeding the machine. So it's like, I can see how the, an author like Cresley Cole, who didn't necessarily do quick releases like that in burnout, but the expectation, yes. you know, that that pressure would cause you to burn out just as quickly. See, I wondered that about how we talked about Captive in the Dark. It's just, mm -hmm. that, that book was like so like, why so would I good. Said, so fucked up, would never read again, would never read anything Everybody like was again. talking about Everybody that book. Everybody was talking Everybody about that Everybody read book. that book. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody, if you were here in 2013, you read, you read that, that book. book. I don't care who you were, yeah. what you liked, you read it. Yeah, you read it. You read the series, and that build to top that, kind of like yeah. Eli James. Mm -hmm. Why didn't she write anything else? Yeah, but she I doesn't like, have to. <laughs> she doesn't have to, but I'm like, yeah, yeah. But you I'm, know, I'm like, I'm not coming up after that. Get out of here. Well, think about it though. Even with El James, the she's doing all the books from his perspective, and it's taken her two, three years between those to release them. She's already got the books written. She just doesn't write it from his side. But it's again, it's that pressure. It's the yeah. the the forcing yourself to go back into it, especially when it's something you've already closed. You've already shut that door. That story's done. To have to go back into that. It took Stephanie Meyer, what, 12 years to finish Midnight Sun? Yeah. I mean, like, my God. You know, yeah. like that that is so real and it happens. So, you know, if anything, if you're, you know, if you're an author and you have, you know, so many books out there it is okay to take a break. I think if anything out of life, I have learned that as an author, that's one of the big things I've learned is that if you don't take a break, your body will force you into it. Yeah. So it, it, it's like you can only go so long at a certain speed before it's like, shut the fuck up, <laughs> you know, yeah, before it right. shuts you down. And I you're think right. like, you know, it, there's if your books are good if your books are worthy people will wait and it's okay like it's, even in kindle unlimited i know there's like this pressure to constantly release and chase the money and and do all that stuff like you're scared no, you're gonna be forgotten i don't exactly. necessarily always think it's about the money i think it's they're scared there's so many people they're scared that they'll mm -hmm. be forgotten if i don't get another yeah, book out they're not gonna everybody's got here. a new release out every couple of days there's a new release you know and yeah, you cannot continue to chase that and still have this be your dream job. It will just become work and you'll resent it. Yeah. Mm, that's so mm. tough. <laughs> but yeah, I, I do just, I echo all the sentiments of Alessandra Torre and Kylie Scott about, you know, their advice on if you're an aspiring author, even if you're an author now, that is something you need to focus on is your newsletter. It's the most important thing. And 
and getting and people download to sign up that, that motherfucker. Yep, <laughs> keep it. Yeah, I download mine every like few months, and I drop it in my Dropbox. That way, if, if even if my Mailchimp camp thing was taken away, I still mm. have my emails because I downloaded them. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's tough. I can't imagine losing that. <laughs> but yeah, so it, you know, it. I would. I wish that, you know, there was some sort of course out there that really gave, gave it straight, but you know, there's not one formula that works for everybody. So even if I sat down and wrote down everything I think you should do to be a successful author, it might not work for you, you know, but yeah. I do think there is an importance in doing, doing things at your own pace that you're able to keep up with. And if the work's good, they'll wait. <laughs> That'll be there. So, all right, let's talk about Ophelia and all her great stuff. So, like I said, we've got palpitation and we're going to play this second installment for you. This is part of the Heartland Metro Hospital series. Um, all the stories are complete. They're all out there. They are interconnected to each other, but they are all standalones and can be read in any order. So you can pick up whichever book you want in this series. Always a happily ever after guaranteed. Um, you can keep reading about the Heartland Metro Hospital in a free novella that is out now, I believe, July 26th. I think that'll be out by the time this airs. Um, it's a hate to lovers romance with Day of the Dead and spooky vibes with a dash of mistaken identity. You can get that for free at OpheliaMartinez.com slash free books. We'll have that link in the show notes. And then um, sign up for this week's giveaway. She is giving away um, a signed paperback of Diagnosis Amor. And it's got the three books in that. It's got remission, um, contusion, and incision. And they're all together. And they all have bonus content as well with stuff that's never been released before. So you can grab that now. Um, I think that, yeah, that's the one that's available on July 26th, that one where they're all bundled together. But you can sign them, sign up for the giveaway and get a signed paperback of that. So. All right. I think that's everything. Oh my gosh. I feel like I'm running through it before they go into the second installment. I don't want them to forget anything. <laughs> All, right. All right. Let's send them in. We'll see you on the side. Bye guys. Chapter five. Carolina's dad, Don Gustavo, must have called her on the way to the hospital since she's sitting next to him in the waiting room when I get there. Was it an MI? I ask the second she sees me. No, I don't think it was a heart attack, Carolina says. Think it was her angina acting up. Dr. Lopez is running tests and she'll update us soon. I nod, taking a deep breath. The head of cardio is the best pair of hands I'd want with mommy right now. I smile at Carolina, knowing she made that happen. As a daughter, I want to storm in there and use my badge to be by her side. But as a doctor... I know I need to let Dr. Lopez do what she does best. I kiss Don Gustavo on the cheek. Gracias, Don Gustavo, I say. He pats my hand. Of course, mija. I ask him what mommy was doing when it happened, and Don Gustavo explains they were both volunteering at our church's pantry. I am annoyed that I finally get mommy to stop working, and she finds a way to work anyway. You know her... She can't sit still. I don't blame her. Some folks just need to work. I know, Don Gustavo. You know, he says, his eyes darting from his daughter to me to Leo. It wouldn't hurt for you three kids to step into the church now and then. Oh, we pray on our own time, don't we, Kami? Leo says, teasing. I narrow my eyes at him. That's good, mijo. I'm glad to hear it. Don Gustavo says. Prayed today, in fact, real worship. Leo ends his thought when I kick his shin. Carolina stifles a snort by biting her lip, and at least Don Gustavo is oblivious to Leo's double entendre. I glare at him, because a hospital waiting room, while mommy is getting heart tests, is hardly the time to be making jokes. But then... That's always been Leo, the one to find humor and lightness in the darkest of situations. My heart aches to know it's a learned trauma response. His mother abandoned him for weeks or months on end when he was a kid to follow some man or other. 
and little Leo's desperate attempts to make her happy so she'd want to stick around turned him into the charismatic and warm man he is today. He was the perfect kid. He never got in trouble, was always smiling, telling jokes, trying to make her laugh. I just know he was trying to make her love him enough to stay this time. Eventually, all that love, joy, and happiness entered our home when mommy decided he'd stay with us whenever his mom disappeared. Papi had already passed by then, and Andres had taken on the role of protector and man of the house. That's how Leo and Andres became as close as brothers. They took care of mommy and me while they finished high school. However he learned it, his never-ending optimism and joy work, because Leo keeps me distracted until Dr. Lopez finds us to update us on mommy. As Carolina predicted, it was angina, and she wants to keep mommy overnight just to be on the safe side. I'm allowed to go in for a quick hello, but then need to let her rest and can visit in the morning. Seeing mommy stable last night calmed me down from my near panic attack, and seeing her light up the room when she sees us this morning is even better. Of course, Leo insisted on visiting with me. You've already got the nurses eating out of the palm of your hand, don't you? Leo says as we walk into her room. Mijo, it's so good to see you. Thanks for bringing Camila last night. She told me you were in the waiting room. Mommy scoots to one side of her hospital bed so that Leo can sit on the edge and bend to hug her. This beautiful, massive man takes my mother's hand in both of his and keeps it there, smiling down at her as if he were looking at his own mother. Mommy brings her free hand to palm his cheek, returning his smile. It's good to see you together. Now, if only we can bring Andres home, I can have all three of mis niños with me. Both Leo and I flinch at Andres' name, and Mommy doesn't miss it. Her eyes narrow and then dart to find me now sitting on a chair in the corner. What's going on? She asks. What do you mean? I ask. I've always been a terrible liar. Leo and Andres never told me any of their plans growing up because they knew whether I intended to snitch or not, I'd somehow manage to spill the beans. Why do you look like you had chile toreado for breakfast when I mentioned your brother's name? Leo lets go of her hand and comes to sit next to me. Don't know what you're talking about. You want meds? He asks, tongue in cheek. Then mommy laughs. Guffaws, actually. What's so funny? I ask, but she can't speak through the laughter, and Leo and I can only blink at each other. Mommy! I scold, crossing my arms in front of me. When her laughter subsides, she says, Mas sabe el diablo por viejo que por diablo. I knew it would happen one day. Her eyes are sparkling, and her little hands ball into triumphant fists. You knew what would happen? I ask. You too, she says like it's a reasonable explanation. Us to what? Leo asks. She points between us. You too. I knew you'd happen one day. I've been waiting for it. Leo, you better put a ring on it and get cracking on my grandbabies because I want to get to meet them and we all know Andres is a lost cause. Leo yells, Senora, at the same time I shout, Mommy, making her laugh again. Now, she says, which one of you two is calling Andres to tell him? Leo and I blink back at her. Blank expressions giving her nothing. Chapter 6 We are waiting on Mommy's discharge paperwork. Leo is working on a jigsaw puzzle with her over a tray, and I'm reading an article when my phone buzzes. I palm my back pocket to find it empty, then look up to find Leo staring at my phone in his hands. I stand to grab it and his thick neck contracts with a swallow when he hands it to me. 
I look at the screen that reads Sam. Declining the call, I place my phone back in my jeans pocket and smile at Leo. Only his brows are pinched together. I want to explain I haven't heard from Sam since I left Boston, but we can't have this conversation in front of Mommy. She already feels guilty enough because she thinks I only moved back home for her, and that she's the reason my engagement ended. I've reassured her that's not the case, but it falls on deaf ears. When Mommy insists she can dress herself and asks for privacy, I finally get the chance to address the call with Leo in the hallway. I haven't spoken to my ex since I've been home, Leo. His brawny arm reaches around my waist to pull me closer to him, and he kisses my forehead. It feels off, somehow, in the way his lips linger there ten seconds too long. I know, Gummy. He's my past Leo, I swear. He lets me go, and his hands go in the pockets of his jeans. Gummy, I... Stop. I say, already expecting his next words that are written all over his pained eyes. Stop what? Whatever you're about to say, don't say it. Gummy, you belong with someone like Sam. You don't even know him. I do, Gummy. Samson Calderon, age 28, graduated summa cum laude from Harvard Medical School, 850 credit score, owns his home outright in Boston. My mouth falls open. What the hell, Leo? His gaze falls to his shoes. Even from afar, Gummy, I've always made sure you were okay. Anyway, Sam is everything I'm not and everything I'll never be. You don't get to tell me who I, I don't mean him necessarily. Leo scratches the back of his neck, but someone like him. My mouth opens to argue some more, but mommy opens her door, ending the conversation there. I'll go grab the car, meet you out front, Leo asks. I nod and watch him walk away while I settle mommy in a wheelchair. Somehow, the sight of the back of his head reminds me of that night after my birthday, when he left me the last time. Chapter 7 The next morning, I invite Don Gustavo for breakfast to keep mommy company while I pretend to run errands, and instead, head straight to Leo's. I fume as I knock on his door and ring the doorbell simultaneously. It's only eight in the morning when Leo opens the door in his boxers and a ribbed tank. I have to remind myself I'm angry, even as my mouth waters at the sight of him. I don't wait for him to ask me in. Instead, I push past him. What the hell, Gummy? He says, rubbing sleep from his eyes and running a hand through his waves. What time is it? What the hell was yesterday? What? You walking away like, my voice cracks. Like last time, what the hell? I pause. Why are you always running from me? Leo groans. I haven't had coffee yet. He gestures for me to follow him into the kitchen, and he gets to work putting on the kettle and grabbing the coffee while I continue my rant. I can't believe you would tell me to be with anyone other than you, or that I should go back to an ex-fiance who I have no interest in, like it's your decision to make, which it isn't. Are you insane? Gamila, slow down, I'm not awake yet. I repeat the only question that matters. Why are you always running from me? Exasperated, he says, I'm not running from you, Gami. I'm saving you from me. What? After what happened between us, there's no way I'm just a one-night fuck, is there? Don't I mean more to you than that? My eyes brim with tears, and Leo stops what he's doing. He sets the French press down and walks over to me. His hands bracket my face, and he ducks to look into my eyes. Gami. You mean everything to me. 
I want you to be happy. That's why I'm stepping aside. You deserve better than what I can. Leonardo Moreno, there is no one better than you. I screech. He scratches the back of his neck and lets out a long sigh. But, but what? He's the type of guy you belong with. What are you talking about? Gami, look at you and look at me. You don't belong with me, you belong with someone like him. His head hangs, and I've never seen him look so defeated. It's my turn to find his eyes. Softly, I say, tell me what that cabezota of yours is thinking. You know. No, I don't know. Gummy, you're, you're some big shot doctor. You have the career, the status. You're one in a million, mi vida, and so fucking smart. And that guy, he's cut from the same cloth. That's the type of guy you end up with. You know that, don't you? Equally smart, the title after his name, the big house I'll never be able to give you, everything. Leonardo Moreno. Nobody but me gets to decide who I end up with. Let's start there. And second, you have a brilliant mind. What is this about? You don't really believe you get stuck with a guy who ends a military career to become a paramedic, do you? Why the hell not? I'm not good enough for you, Gami. He nearly yells that time, like he's frustrated even to believe it himself. We have nothing in common. If I were a person looking in, I'd bet I could see the smoke coming from my ears when I grab his arm and lead him to sit on his couch. I get on his lap so our faces can be level and hold his head in my hands. Leonardo Moreno, you are the best man I've ever known. I've loved you since I was a little girl. I fell in love with you when I kissed you the first time, and I never fell out of love. It wasn't some silly little girl crush. I was a kid, but that was real, and the feeling never left me. Gummy, I know. That's not what I'm saying. And as for you not being good enough, you, you are so fucking brave. You served your country, baby. Do you know how proud and how grateful I am to you and my brother for doing that? Leo stays quiet, stunned by my words. You know, you and Andres are why I wanted to be a doctor. His brow furrows. What? I wanted to join the army as a doctor. I knew I couldn't work on you two if you ever needed it, but I could work on your brothers. Serve my country as you have. You have been my role models my whole life. Everything I've done has been because you inspired it. I never got the chance because mommy started getting sick, and I couldn't bear to tell her all three of her kids would be enlisted. She'd have had a heart attack for sure. Gami, I didn't know. No, you didn't, Menso, because you never stayed in touch. And being a paramedic is amazing. You serve your community now. Without you, I wouldn't have a job. It'd just be a morgue. I pause when he chuckles. But don't you see? I'm the lucky one to have you, not the other way around. He smiles at me just before he steals another kiss. And I know my words have sunken in. Finally. How about this then, he says. Why don't we say we're both the lucky ones? Chapter eight. So, Leo says, Sam, what did he say? I never spoke with him. You didn't? No, there was no unfinished business. No reason to speak ever again. You think he wants you back? Never mind. Dumb question. Of course he wants you back. I laugh and Leo smiles. Dumbest mistake of his life is my gain. I should never have said yes to marrying him. 
while I was in love with someone else. Our next kiss steals our breath and lasts so long my head becomes dizzy. It might have lasted one minute or one hour, and I wouldn't be able to say for sure. I didn't notice when Leo hardened beneath me sitting on his lap, but the full, steely length presses firmly against the seam of my jeans. A pool of wet gathers at my center, and I grind on him between moans. Leo telling me he loves me back over and over as he comes up for air from our kiss. He unbuttons my jeans and sneaks his hand lower until his thumb finds my clit. My entire body shudders on contact, and Leo breathlessly says, Baby, you are so wet for me, and fuck, your clit. It drives me crazy how engorged it gets for me. That particular description of my body makes me blush, and I bury my face in Leo's shoulder. He chuckles. Where's my confident doc now? He teases. He's still rubbing my clit in circles, leaving me incapable of complete words, let alone sentences. Instead of answering, I bite his shoulder his perfectly toned, bulging shoulder that I've been dying to bite. His response is sending a finger into me as he continues to rub my clit. Leo, I pant and clench around his finger. Fuck, baby, what the hell? His surprise makes me giggle, and I clench a second time just before he gives me a second finger. That feels so good, Kami. Can't wait for you to clench like this around my cock. Yes, please, I say. He smiles and kisses me again, pumping his fingers in me. Can you be a good girl and take a third finger from me? He asks. I nod at him and feel the extra stretch of the added intrusion. How about four, baby? Can you be good for me and take all four? Again, I nod, and this time I grunt at the unbelievable stretch. It dawns on me he's preparing me for him and his girth. And thank fuck, because that thing is massive. The sting of the stretch lasts only a few seconds. And as he pumps slowly, I relax around him, enjoying the feel of his skin inside my body. That's a good girl he whispers. My hand skates down his arm until it finds his and pulls it out of my jeans. I pop off him to strip down, towing off my shoes and peeling off my pants and underwear. As I do this, he removes his boxer shorts and tank. I'm still in my shirt when I find my place on his lap again, and he smiles when he realizes I want him to take it off for me. He does so slowly and massages my breast through my bra. When he reaches around me to undo it, I nibble on his neck, breaking his concentration and making him fumble. Kami, behave, he teases. Free of the bra, he grabs my waist and lifts me up and over him. I descend around him slowly, kissing him when his head parts my lips. I'm nervous. Nervous this will hurt, nervous because it's Leonardo, and we can't take this back. This is the point of no return. I take an inch of him and watch as a vein pops on the side of his neck as he restrains himself from moving. His hands tighten around my waist, but he's not pulling me down onto him. Another inch and I kiss him and kiss him until I've taken all of him in my body. He wraps both arms around me, pressing me close to his body, then caresses my back gently, easing me onto him. It's such a tender move. I can't help the tears that spring to my eyes. Leo, I say. Mi vida, are you okay? I nod. Then I clench around him and start grinding. Camila. Mi vida, fuck. 
he growls as I circle my hips. He lets me move, adjust, and enjoy as I explore his body for long minutes. I don't stop to think about the fact that we didn't so much as talk about a condom, birth control, or our last checkups. But this is Leo. I trust him. The thought of not being on birth control should terrify me, only I know this is the man I'll have a family with one day. And that thought, well, it's not scary at all. We have time for lovemaking later. Right now, I need more. I hold his head to lock eye contact. Leo? Yes? I need you to fuck me hard. His pupils expand, and he stands with me on him, then brings me to my back on the couch, never disconnecting our bodies. When he kisses me again, it's rough, and he bites my lip, not so tenderly this time. But the pain is welcome as he drills into me in long thrusts that are so loud it's the only sound around us. The depth is incredible, and within minutes I arch my back, but it's when one of his hands cups the back of my head in a move so gentle, I feel cherished like I never have before, that I come. I come long and hard, and welcome his release when he shudders inside me, joining me in heaven. At some point, we move to his bedroom and talk about everything that's next. When he's had a rest and his coffee, we make love again this time for hours. I needed the fuck, but he needs the tenderness, and I'm all too happy to offer it. I don't remember falling asleep, only that I drifted with arms that felt like home wrapped around me. It's his voice coming from downstairs that wakes me. I cover myself with the bedsheet and follow the sound, tiptoeing down the stairs. I tell myself I'm only going to take a peek at who's visiting, but when I see him, he's talking on his phone. You know I wouldn't, Leo says, one hand running through his hair in frustration. Who told you? No, man, don't get it twisted. I know, I know, because of you, out of respect for you. If you didn't exist, we would have been together the entire time. My heart picks up speed, and I press my chest with one hand to soothe it. Oh no, he's telling Andres about us. Someone spilled the beans. Silence for a moment as Leo listens. He sits on the couch and leans his elbows to his thighs, his face buried in his free hand. More gently, he says, I'm not sorry, Andres. You're like a brother to me, but she's the one. I'm not telling you that. What? No, Andres, man, come on. Trust me, you don't want to know. When you come home next month, will it make you feel better to punch my face? You always did say it was too pretty for my own good. For a long moment, Leo listens. I watch his mouth turn into a sad, resigned smile. When he says, I do. My heart flutters, and tears spring to my eyes because I know in my heart what he just said I do, too. Then he says it, so there's no room for my brother's interpretation. I love her. Epilogue One year later. When Andres came home to visit shortly after Leo and I started dating, he did not punch his pretty little face as promised. My brother, the army ranger, simply reminded Leo of exactly how many ways of killing he holds in his repertoire. Leo assured him he would never force him into hiding a body. It got a bit morbid, but still went better than I expected. At the time, Leo explained Andres had called him after finding out, source still unconfirmed, or Leo would never have told Andres before we discussed it first. Mommy has been over the moon and keeps dropping hints at Leo to propose. Andres comes home again today, 
and Leo is even more nervous than when he came home the last time. We're having a little cookout welcome party for him, and everyone from our neighborhood is here today, including Carolina and her dad, Don Gustavo, my hero who saved mommy's life by forcing her to the hospital. Leo keeps pacing and can't find enough things to do. I'm going out for ice, he says. We have enough ice, amor, I remind him. Can never have too much ice. I walk over to him, patting my belly and grabbing his hand. We, in fact, can have too much ice. You've done three trips for ice today. He smiles and kisses me. Sorry, a bit nervous. Andres will be fine. I hope you're right. The man terrifies me. Andres goes straight to mommy and lifts her off the ground when he hugs her. It's a strange visual, the beastly ranger with a hardened face, smiling as he picks up the short brown woman in his arms. We let them exchange a moment before he comes to me next and repeats the process. I squeal when he lifts me off the ground. We're all giggles when he sets me down. ¿Cómo estás, Esquinkla? He asks, and I roll my eyes. Next, he takes Leo into their bro hug. He's gripping Leo's hand when he senses something is off and asks, What is it? We, uh, have news, Leo says, dropping Andres's hand. Andres takes a step back, and Leo holds me to his side protectively. Camila and I are married. What? Andres says. He shakes his head. No, mommy would have told me. We eloped, I add. Went to Vegas last summer and wanted to wait for you to get home to break the news. You know I wanted to walk you down the aisle, Andres says. I know, but I didn't want a big wedding. We can have a small party if you want and you can do it then. Promise? Andres asks, but it's Leo who answers him. Promise, Leo says. There's more, I say, doing my best not to wince. What the hell more could there be? Andres asks. I hold my belly, and Andres's eyes track the movement. His eyes widen to saucers, then... I'm going to be an uncle? He asks. I nod. I'm going to be an uncle. He screams and picks me up again for another twirl. Everyone is looking at us. And I peek at mommy who's asking Carolina what Andres said. My eyes go wide. Shh, I say. What? Andres asks. We haven't told mommy yet, I say. Andres doubles over with a cackle, and when he straightens up again, he grips Leo's shoulder. Can't wait to see you tell mommy you robbed her of her only daughter's wedding and knocked her up. Leo groans but says nothing as his complexion turns ashen. Andres continues. You were afraid of telling me? Huh, can't wait to see you tell mommy. Andres's glee doesn't annoy me. They've always given each other shit. I grab Leo's hand and smile down at our linked hands, thinking about how tortilla marriage prophecies are bullshit. I look up at my husband. It's okay. We'll do it together. Want to read more about the Heartland Metro Hospital staff? You can now read Carolina and Hector's story in remission, a slow burn, hate to lovers medical romance with a deliciously forbidden age gap. The end. This has been Palpitation by Ophelia Martinez. Read for you by Ruby Hunt. Welcome back. Hey, hey, hey. Thank you so much to Ophelia Martinez for giving us palpitation. This was so fantastic to feature it this week and all her great stuff. Make sure you check out our social media and everything else with all her links and stuff. Let's not the book box. 
Oh yeah, the book box. Okay, Hot Girl Summer. It's gonna be up by this time, so it's gonna oh, be. Shit. I think yeah. Why not? We're just waiting for the books to come in. Yeah, we can get that's the it. Going. We're just waiting on the books, and we're gonna be on a two week break, so we might as well tell them now that. Oh yes. Okay. Yes. 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 Hot Girl Summer boxes. Sign up for the newsletter. You will be the first to know when they go live. We will click to update the website, and then we will send out an email. So and yeah, maybe I should we'll release update. it. Maybe I should release it Friday. So this will play Thursday next week. Oh, that's and a good idea. So Friday. So make sure you're on the newsletter, and I'll send out the first wave. There's only a limited number of boxes, yep. and we sold out last time in like an like hour a and a half. Yeah, it was really fast. It was, it was really fast. fast. And these are bigger and better in my opinion. These ones. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the boxes are pretty much the same size, but there's better stuff in them. I there's think, cooler so. stuff. There's like, way more stuff. There was like six things in it last time. There's like 15 in it this time. So. Yeah. There's a ton yeah, of fun it's stuff. It's really fun. Mm -hmm. So make sure you're signed up for the newsletter. I'll put that in the show links. Okay. And then we'll be back in a few weeks. With yeah. We're going to be off for two weeks. And then when we come back, we're going to have a brand new book from Alexa Riley. Yes. It's part Yay! of the, uh, the royalty series. Yes. The best mm -hmm. friend is getting a book along. Everybody with has asked, is Emma getting a story? And we're like, yes, yes obviously. <laughs> She's so, coming on along. So, yeah. So that will be the book that we'll come back with next season. So, yep. I guess we'll see it. you then. Yeah. Tell them what to do. <laughs> Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read.